So I'm Lisa Martin, she, her. I'm on the POG board, thanks for joining us. This is our annual season kickoff. I can move that. So welcome to POG and Friends. Um, we typically thank the following groups and organizations for their support. Arizona Commission on the Arts, Poets and Writers, U of A Poetry Center, Yay. in the house, <laughs> U of A English Department, I don't know if that's in the house, the Journal Arizona Quarterly, which is housed in the English Department, and Chats Press, I know they're in the house. <laughs> Big thanks also to the many individual patrons and sponsors for their generous donations. If you're interested in joining that group of sponsors, please visit our website at pogartstucson.org. Um, we have almost had one year of our Sabino Poets Group gathering monthly in Sabino and it's been wonderful. Uh, so if you're curious about that or want to be on the mailing list for that, I think you might want to join us sometime. Um, talk to me, I'll get you on the mailing list. Uh, we typically walk a total of two or three miles, but we find various places in the canyon to sit, write, share writing, enjoy that beautiful place. Um, speaking of land, we wish to acknowledge that being based in Tucson in the Sonoran Desert, we're on the ancestral homelands of the Tohono O'odham and Pascoyaki nations. In consideration of the history of violence and dispossession, we encourage folks to reflect on how we can move forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. I understand the origin stories of the Otham mention their ancestors emerging in this area to be stewards of the land. So we as individuals can find ways to support that effort. As a poetry group, we can continue to bring voices from Arizona's Native nations to a wider audience through programming. Next month, on October 7th, Ophelia Zepeda will be reading with Charles Bernstein. <laughs> Heavy hitters at Sculpture Tucson, which is at the far west end of Brandy Fenton Park. So I'm sure as a flyer emerges for that, there'll be some kind of little map. Please join us for that. Um, there's flyers that show all our upcoming readings at the front table there. The following month, there's a Zoom reading with Orlando White and Myung Mi Kim. So very diverse, wonderful year of programming coming up. POG is committed to being an inclusive, supportive, safe space for everyone. If anything happens here tonight that makes you uncomfortable, please reach out to one of our board members, Charles and I. Who else is here? We're, we're on a skeleton crew tonight. Um, I'm going to go over the list of readers just so you can sort of have in the back of your mind what part of this lineup you're in. Um, I don't know, Reed Dixon is not here, is he? He was iffy. Um, so, Brianna Botham, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, you're going to lead off here. Just a moment. Jeremy Hensley follows that. And Sophie Dawes. Then Cynthia Hogue. Emily Thomas, Richard Tavener, what a great list. Gabriel Dozal, Sarah Kornmeyer. I don't know if we'll do a little break in here somewhere, but then Mari Jerez, David Weiss. Hey. 
Uh, so he's not with us. Cameron, Kwan Louie. Tenny is not with us. Charles. Then myself. Then we hope Cynthia's going to be back. Cynthia Miller wrapping up with Logan Phillips. So. Oh, what a night. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to say something, I want to say something good. We have a little more time because the people are missing, so I want to say something and bore you to tears. No. Uh, uh, please take one of these. We've, we've never managed at our first reading before to have our whole annual schedule <laughs> here, so that's a, a, an accomplishment. Uh, what's well, but on, on the other hand, we may seem a little spacey tonight because we've had our directors uh, falling to flus and COVIDs and things right and left the last uh, day or two. So there's only Lisa and me and then Cynthia later here tonight, whereas usually we might have eight of us. And there's a few people, a couple people out of town for the whole fall too. Um, also, uh, I wanted to say, and I wasn't listening, so since if Lisa already said this, I apologize, but our next reading and all the rest of our in-person readings for this year are going to be at a different location. They're going to be at Sculpture Tucson, which is a beautiful site, um, kind of on the edge of Brandy Fenton Park at the intersection of Alvernon and River Road. And so uh, we hope you will follow us there. It's, it's quite nice there. But the next reading there could be really crowded, so come on time. <laughs> okay. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to say, so, so I'm doing this and then I still get to take my time as a poet later because I'm greedy. Uh, I, was, I was looking around today, besides the first day of fall, welcome to fall, uh, you know, what, what poetic uh, moments should we celebrate today? If you've been to a reading at the Steinfeld Warehouse before, you know we pause for trains. Or if you're in the midst of your reading and you can do your rhythms to interact with the train, that has happened once and it was quite beautiful. It, it, after all the construction's done, and the cars are all going under the train tracks, the trains will still be there, but they won't be blowing their horns anymore. So sometime that will happen. So September 23rd is the birthday of the Indian poet Ramdari Singh Dinkar. And I didn't know who that was either, but now I want to read everything that that person wrote. And he was born in 1908. And so I wanted to read this to kick off this, which is a little bit about what not to do in your relationships with the gods, particularly Krishna. Okay. And this was about a, a, a noble whose name was Duryodhan, who would not give gifts, which would have caused him to receive the blessings of society. So he tried to imprison Krishna. And this is Krishna's response. He roared and expanded his form. The mighty trembled as the Lord angered spoke. Bring out your chains. And yes, Duryodhan, try to imprison me. Look, the skies are within me. The wind is within me. The entire universe is within me. Immortality and destruction both are within me. The dawn is my forehead. The solar system is my chest. My arms have surrounded the earth, the Mainak and Maru are at my feet, and my mouth holds all the luminous planets and constellations. If you are capable, then see the whole universe in me, the living, the non-living, the eternal, millions of suns, millions of moons, millions of rivers and oceans. You have come to arrest me, have you got a chain big enough? Because imprisoning me is like trying to chain that limitless sky. 
When you cannot measure infinity, how can you imprison me? You did not heed good advice and did not value our friendship, so I will leave you now, making this vow. No more requests. There will be a war now. Victory will be the fate of life or death. Constellations will clash. Fire will rain down on the earth. I kind of feel like it's happening now. Uh, um, the Shishnag will bear its hood and death will open its jaws. Brothers will fight brothers as arrows rain down and good men will suffer while the jackals and hyenas will feast. In the end, you will be destroyed and you are the cause of all violence. A deadly silence descended on the court. Everyone was scared. Some had fallen silent while some had fainted, except for two who remained unaffected. Dhiratarashtra and Vidur were the fortunate ones, with hands joined, fearless, and with love in their hearts. They kept chanting, Hai, Hai, which is like, pray, pray, pray. So, be good to Krishna, and have a great <laughs> night. And the first reader is Brianna. Um, the reading first is really tough sometimes, but I'm excited for you guys because I'm not a tough act to follow, so this is great. <laughs> okay. I only have two for you. Um, the first one, if you've come to Tucson Poetry Festival readings, you may have heard before, uh, but it got published a couple months ago and I wanted to celebrate that, so. Yay! <laughs> so, it's called According to Darwin, canine teeth are often less pronounced or absent in the females of many species. Keep the eye and give me the tooth. Gnawing seems more handy. When will I learn to eat the fruit and spit the pit out? Everyone knows to expel the stone of stone fruit still. I can swallow some cyanide. Marrow of a cherry's bone. Let it ferment in the gut before entering the bloodstream. Symptoms of slow poisoning are the same as fast, just gradual, present, and unnoticed for years so the bane remains undiscovered. Night sweats, damp summer sheets, and I cannot help myself from finding you in the dark, from tasting the way lust makes you quiet. Dizziness or weakness usually proceeding. Ache in the head and irritability in the skin, alternating needle pricks across the arm and fluttering stomach muscles with your proximity. Difficulty swallowing with both fellatio and the onset of tears. When your mood or mind shifts and I become nothing, or you become everything wrong in the world. I don't know if there's a train. <laughs> Just for a little while. The rashes appear nightly, and after a few years, they become a part of one's bodily inventory. So we cycle through acute onset and remissions. Double vision. Teeth become less with use. They are not muscle. And though there is an invisible meridian from eye to canine, one is bigger than the other. So many hard seeds among the softer flesh, cyanide building, the enamel wears away. Still, the jaw is gruesomely useful. Thank you. Um, the other is like the opposite of published. It's like a draft, and I do that to combat my perfectionism. So I like to share works in progress to fight that. <laughs> it's called A Prayer for Hatred. I give you up to oblivion. One moment, eyes closed, body rigid. I am sure I cannot love you again. The next I awake, I'm running, panicked fingers grasping for all the little pieces of you. I used to love the way it felt. The small, ordinary miracle of it. A grin not even meant for me, but for the dog. And something like a moth tugs at my stomach. Tension all at once evaporates from my muscles, the same way a paper cut heals, involuntary. Bodies attuned to one another, imperceptible until unwilling. Now it's a kind of nausea, gently pulled by the invisible thread from my navel to your thumb. <laughs> your fingers fasten around my wrist, 
goodwill penetrating me again. And the shame of this is hot and wet between my legs. There's pleasure still. I've been gathering crimson candles. Hatred is a small god who won't hear me, but I like them anyway. The temple will feed you bread 
on a golden plate, then name your pain holy to the smallness of your face. The world gives you only what it wants to take back later. Does that make it a credit broker? No answer becomes an answer, and it's a terrible way to die. Lawrence died on a gridiron hoisted over open fire. After some time, he exclaimed quite happily, he was done and ready to be turned over. Isn't that funny? into the gooey batter, sitting in their tiny tin muffin coffins. I turn up the hot, hot oven and pray that my wishes come true. I steal a package of Hanes white underwear from the department store. I punch my favorite pillow three times and then yell cry into it. I look at myself in the mirror and demand to know, is that all you got? But I've never asked myself, how sad would I be if I were the cast around my broken leg? Because real love resides in the top half millimeter of your fingernails, if you want to love yourself, you got to claw the love into your skin, sister. You got to claw. The other day, this friend acquaintance of mine, Kelsey, said my band was silly. And I wanted to know why. What do you mean my band is silly, Kelsey? <laughs> I wheelbarrow myself out to the alley and make sure to not ask any questions. No questions. Hold my pupils up to the sunlight. If they shrink, I don't really love you. If they dilate, I'm in love with you and we can have sex right away. After having this thought about the cast around my hypothetical broken leg, I go out dancing, get real drunk, and yell ask everyone in the bar, who wants a piece of this? No one in the bar responds. Intermittently gyrating my pelvis, and then swaying, I yell ask again, no one? <laughs> I was told recently to never ride the show Pony Backwards. Two handlers in khaki brushed her long white hair lovingly and said to me without looking up, this pony is reserved for the shows. Thank you. <laughs> I send an expensive basket of fruit up to pretty Rebecca's third story window and call up to her. Please, pretty Rebecca, won't you smile down on me? I ask her this a couple times when a drunk man stumbling down the street stands next to me and screams the same thing out of her window. Please, pretty Rebecca, won't you smile down on me? I look him dead in the eyes and say, hey, beat it, man. This is my gay fantasy. <laughs> but he just stumbles back a bit and leers at me. When Sun Ra sings There Is No Day, I like know what he means when he sings that. Because I'm looking for authenticity. A-U-T-H-E-N-T-I-C-I-T-Y. I keep seeing signs for the special event parking. <laughs> and I'm wondering if I'm the special event everyone is trying to park. <laughs> to this day, I throw my hairbrush so that its plastic handle flies off and black bristles land on the floor. I keep finding black pew-blank bristles in the capel, in the vacuum, in the couch. One day, I can accept love into my heart and not vomit. One day, I can accept love into my heart and not vomit. One day, I can accept love into my heart and not vomit.
You are more than the sum of your parts, or however the saying goes. High up in the mountains, the young woman pours milk from a glass bottle onto her rain-soaked field. Rats sip white milk from the dark soil. The rats know when it rains here, it snows on the mountain. They know how long it takes for the white snow light from the mountain to meet their eyes and the eyes of the other small rodents in the field. But what about the eyes of the woman and the eyes of the viewer viewing her in this painting? How long until snow light reaches them? Snow is a serious weather. And when the clouds grumble high above, Snow will have nothing to do with it. Snow is serious today and rolls herself down the mountainside, getting stuck in trees and cliffs along the way. Viewer viewing this painting, please know. Every day at dusk, a little you walks out of the fog toward the you that's working in the barn. When little you gets to the door, greet them warmly and take the cold hands in yours. You may know your heart as well as your milk-soaked, rat-infested field. You may know your heart like the back of your lover's hand, but you don't love it like the rats do. Thank you, and thank you, Paul. Next up is Cynthia Hope. Such great energy tonight. Mm -hmm. To hide a child. Most of this book comes from doing research on my husband's family. He was born into occupied France. And uh, after he had a heart attack, I began to research. Um, and by, re by research, I mean doing some secondary research, but also interviewing family members who were born during the war about what they remember. To hide a child, France, 1941. One who's speaking, please. It no longer matters. Who else knew? No one. We trusted no one. Was the child small enough to fit into a cupboard? One day when soldiers came, the child Sauvage arrived from the blue horizon, hungry. Did the child look foreign? What does foreign look like to you? Two. How could a child travel alone? Not the child, but the wild apples in the fields along the lanes, past our house or our business, to collect them in season, to make the tart sauce for pork in fall. Did you hide this child out of guilt? The child was in danger from us, unmoved, gazing out our window. Did you embellish the story? Three, children harried, Rounded up, and worse, there, then, as here, now. Why not close the blinds to the soaring poplars, their glossy leaves and populated shadows? We happened to be looking hard, and at last saw that the child's danger... Somebody left their sunglasses up here. Please. Anybody? Oh, okay. Don't forget them. Okay. Um, who brings their computer? I, All right. I don't have a printer anymore. Who has a printer in their house anymore? We're not joking. I'm, I'm, I'm jealous that you have a printer. Okay. Um, so my name is Emily. Thanks for listening. Can you the mic? I can. Thank you. Um, how about that? Sorry, I'm 5'5". Five five. I think Cynthia is like 5'8". 
or some perhaps less mad Marjorie of Kemp. I remember one time in college when an MFA student came to a class I took on medieval mystics to give a talk on Marjorie. She saw her everywhere, on the BART train, in People's Park, reading tarot on Telegraph, screaming incessantly on Shattuck. I decided to play this game too. I see her literally everywhere. I used to see her in the man who bounced the tennis ball as he read from the Torah in front of the entrance to the Park Street tea stop, in the heroin addict who murmured stories to himself like so many lullabies strung together with the screeching and clawing of the trains winding through the tunnels at the Prudential Center, in the spare change man who played a good monster but really just liked to smoke joints with his friends in the Charles Street station. I see her in Tucson too. She is in the roller skating heroin dealer and in Robert, the shirtless, angry, gentle man with crazy hair, and also in Andrew, who is sometimes on his meds. Most of all, I see her in myself. I keep making bad choices. Did I say that I was looking for signs? I've been having visions, too. When we camped at City of Rocks, I could hear chanting and owls hooting and angry calls from spirits telling me to just give up as the wind ripped through the weird dinosaur rocks. There were little furry creatures hovering in the shrubs on my walk to the bathroom in the middle of the night. Or were they just shadows? I say just shadows like it's less scary. Exasperated and vigilant, I know the sign is coming soon, and the spirits keep whispering, give up, let go, fall apart. Um, okay, cicada apocalypse. I don't know what's going on out there, but it feels like <laughs> spirits. <laughs> okay. Uh, little withered monarch corpses are littered everywhere. We walk between the old warehouses and the train. There are bicycles in the rafters of the sky, so we pull some down and take a less hazardous route. Follow the better cactus. Sit next to it. Wait until it tells you. There are always Blink-182 songs blaring from the boarding house next to your old apartment. As revenge, we fucked in front of the kitchen window. You were wearing those oversized yellow rubber gloves. <laughs> but those boarding house fellas were not the least bit offended. <laughs> they stood and watched like dogs in front of wishbone ads on TV. The dogs were nicer after that. We cleaned out the backyard, found a fat black widow with three large egg sacks. You and Rob torched her. I felt kind of sad for two or three days. But the yard looked nice. The, thing, the next thing I did was plant a garden. I listened to Joni Mitchell. I adjusted the budget. We talked in spheres and danced like sexy noodles and fought and fucked and fucked and fucked. And then I have one more. Thanks, thanks again for listening. Uh, origin story for a superhero. It was unexpected. Jan got really fat and punched the neighbor. Or did she get fat after she punched the neighbor? I can't remember how the story goes, but I do know that the guy telling it was a real fuckhead. Poor Jan. He dropped her off at the home, made a profile on plentyoffish.com, and met a woman named Tiffany. He's never been happier. Today is a cloudy day, and also, I got caught in a, an elaborate lie. Sometimes I'm afraid of being alone, but then again, I'm almost always dying to be alone. Earlier, I looked up at some mesquite trees and thought how nice it was for us to be alone together. We joined in reaching our limbs to the sky. A bully walks into a bar, tells me I better be better, believe in God, watch my money, stop living behind, beyond my means. Unfortunately, I burst right through my means on a daily basis. I have no other way. I want to jump right off this planet, take the dog with me. I'll wear the butterfly cowboy boots and my real plastic raincoat from the Albuquerque thrift store. Today, I got tangled up in a lie. It was well-intentioned. It was like Jan punching the neighbor. It was not the lie, but the truth that made me snap. 
I'm not very capable, but I keep propelling myself forward, boot clad, desperately needing a haircut. I feel what it feels like to feel. Someday I'll climb one of the mesquites and at the top cry out to God, help, I'm down here. Thank you. Hello, I'm Richard Taverner, poet and electrician. <laughs> Thoughts like fish. Not till the nudging of root or stem made deep thoughts when swimming like fish in the plant covered pond catch our distracted eyes. Horizon in weather. To stand in a field without fences or windbreaks and beyond distance stretching away where vision searching must finally fail. We are the center and as we move it does too circling round us in winter's misty light its heavy air absorbs our sight. And there is no edge then on this treeless plain. It is a verge, it continues. One may walk into it, but what's gained is also lost. Soloist. Our minds reason like a lone tree in a fertile field must tanker itself with deep roots. For in the winds of emotion, though moved itself, might be taken by the sight of swaying waves of grass, the uplifting of heads to sky, the bowing down to earth, and be tempted to join that heartfelt chorus below. It may wish to lose its lonely perspective, its lengthy solo, and lie down among the many, absorbed and absolved. 57th year on earth. Yeah, that's about 20, 20 years ago now. <laughs> It was my 57th year on earth, stood there then in the afternoon, autumn amid the green of my garden. My wife is witness, and I in her eyes, lover and maker, worker in the world, blue of the day, black of the night, girt and shod by leather of the animal, my body and heart hers. Nature points to my heart with its wooden finger. It has stirred me in all of its seasons and will someday beckon me, follow in its air, soil, and water. For a moment, I will be one and all. I will not witness my dispersal. By wind and water, bug, bird, or fish, but I know my cell will climb the stem again. Hens roost. When at dusk, the hens take to their roost, squabbling about who sits where. There's a quiet that follows, that welcomes the cricket. After me, Gabriel. Hello. Uh, thank you to Charles and Pog. Uh, like I echo what Cynthia said, there's a great uh, energy uh, in the room. So uh, this poem has uh, some uh, audience participation. I usually don't do audience do anything like that. Um, so your all's job. I'm going to ask a question towards the end of the poem. The question is, who will get to cross the living? And then I'll point at you all and everyone say, no, just the living's lips. 
Do you think we can do this? We can, do we can practice really quick. Who will get to cross the living? No, just the living slips. That's rocks. Heck yeah. All right. Border, here we go. A border simulator. More aptly. Boundary till next time. Chirons chew the crossers. The stories can't shut their mouths. The stories sometimes wish they could shut their mouths. The stories are fed the crossers in perpetuity. Stories thirst for creosote and desperate surely would wane at some point, we thought. Oh, flood of bulking, who writes these chirons? Oh, flood of bulking, let news's teats, sorry, tweets, send you to heaven. <laughs> the heaven of revolving doors, and oh wait, something stuck in the revolving door, and the door now refuses to revolve. On closer inspection, it's the bodies of crossers piled up at the revolving door. No one gets to heaven. The lips of some crossers were squeezed off in the revolving door, and the lips talked their way back to the real border. Let news's teases send lips back to heaven. Quiet stream of lips of the living dead at the border. And it's this quiet stream of lips that crossers step into as they pass and ask the lips, who will get to cross the living? No, just the living's lips. Quiet stream of lips of the living dead now in heaven. So this next uh, poem is a very, very like rough uh, a draft. I, I, I write like large pieces and I just get like my greatest hits. I think Cameron put it in a really cool way. It's like a personal cento or cento or whatever. So these are just random lines that I like. <laughs> One must always find humor in the border, like making fun of your son for listening to Evanescence. <laughs> A light trained on the crosser so we can see his creases and wrinkles and lines. Who among us has crossed through the lines of a crosser's face? There's laundry in my mentions. Sister of the lords of the shouts, invisible hands can't create a border. Customs, see, customs sees plots everywhere, narratives and then graves. I have laundry in my mentions. We needn't be disaster shopping so early in the season. <laughs> to customs, I did not paint the painting of crossers that I'm famous for. I haven't painted anything like my most famous painting from Crosser. Crossers don't need the story, you just need the headline. You don't need the interview, you just need the Chiron. How are you so hungry, yet full at the same time? Can a resident be open borders and close the crosser's mouth? A sleeve made of bones of a wizard. A winding ocean of cars at the port of entry. More depth and shadow in the capturing of the face. A process where old memories steam in the heart and new crossers oxidize into existence. My skull duggery, my Nutella spring, you don't have to be faster than customs, you just have to be faster than the crosser next to you. The wrinkle in the border, what's in the wrinkle? Are crossers hidden inside the wrinkle? Do not let any wrinkle go unironed. Wrinkles on the border, what? Does this cream hide wrinkles? A time portal has been hiding in this wrinkle. We just found a wrinkle from 20 years ago. Customs books you a room that doesn't exist. And in this poem, you are also a room that doesn't exist, or at least your room is not supposed to exist. Hide in your room, the one that doesn't exist. You're the galaxy that I've waited for. Dust off those dungarees and saddle up, or become the saddle. Yes, if I can ride on you, dear crosser, that would be the most effective way to cross back into simulation. I told the crossers below, I'm going to shower you with my cross. I tried to explain the border, and the gulps were louder than the laughs. Passing around a USB key 
like it was a joint. This is Chambers for those who hate Chambers. On YouTube, I am watching a Lifetime original documentary from 1995, narrated by Janine Garofalo about the life of singer Natalie Merchant. They're at the part where they talk about her time with the band 10,000 Maniacs. I also thought she was South African. I wasn't the only one. <laughs> Sarah Kornmeyer. format so much. Isn't it great energy? Um, so I realized when I was putting this together that um, I'm kind of a dumbass and I gave this poem a title that I've only ever seen written and I've never heard anyone speak. So is it epithalamium or epithal epithalamium? Lamium. Lamium, thank you. Uh, so it's a wedding song, right? Uh, made from Shakespeare's Sonnet 116. Let me bend the star whose love alters me. Let me love the tempest's edge. Let me take time's error and prove it. Let me not alter the bark of me. And then this next one is a uh, the first public airing of this piece. This is um, called Letter to Liam Kortemeyer, March 20, 2003 to March 19, 2019. At the moment when you died, I was flashing through the ocean, deeper, further out than anyone, because I'd found a way to block the cold. I paused. The woman who'd shown me how to travel like this, warming ourselves from within all night and lighting our own way, she looked back at me inquiringly, and I rested on an iceberg. Bright sunlines, blue miles of nothing between us and the place from which we'd come. I knew, without feeling tired, that I had reached the end of the power in my blood. I have to turn back, I said, and my mentor dove ahead, swimming on, turning as I watched into a creature of ice and fin I wasn't ready for. And I woke not knowing you had already picked up the gun. I woke not really knowing you at all. To stop, the day before your 16th birthday. To leave a twin behind. To be the second child in two generations of this family to die this way. I am keeping tallies in my mind, the things I have that you do not. My husband's hand curled on my thigh. A parking spot, a tax return. A planned return to Merida, the iced fruit drinks, the nighttime patio that delighted me the first time I ever left this country. I was 17. It was the first time I saw for sure there was a world to want. Thank you. This is a good time to like for all the family that join you at poetry readings. We should like give them some thanks, you know, because they come, they join us. They're good people. If you need one, I have a few back there. <laughs> Last monsoon. The first week of July, I fold worries into the kitchen sink, in the creases of a monthly water bill, in the hairy mess pulled from the shower drain. 
What if that was the last monsoon? I ask out loud. Sometimes only the chickens seem to hear, running for cover under the pomegranate tree. What if that was the last monsoon? I whisper, blowing air from my lips on the large Nepal pads, hoping to create welcome spots for baby napalitos, for ruby red fruit the Gila woodpecker always eats before I get there with tongs in hand. The first week of July, I blow air into the sky above, wondering if I can create my own weather pattern. If I blow here, kiss here, point here, step here, dance there. The first week of July, I fold worries into the kitchen sink, in the creases of my electric bill, in the plastic outdoor chair, its edges brittle from the sun, ready to dissolve into the city's dust. What if that was the last monsoon? I wonder, looking at my face in the mirror, sun blotches, lines, spaces that remind me of my mother. Rain comes, eventually, in torrents. Shingles fly off roofs, hail pelts concrete, citrus leaves unfurl, and creosote lifts into the air, and even the quacha from the chicken coop completes this desert swamp that I adore. Yet still I ask, what if this is the last monsoon? I whisper, blowing air from my lips to yours, wondering if I should prepare for the days that harden us into the city's dust, our own weather patterns. I was glad to see that I am not the only person out in the poetry world who would also request sometimes some audience participation. <laughs> in fact, I would like to see this become a thing that we do, and maybe Tucson is the place where we can get this started. <clears throat> this is called The Last um, on Rooster of Menlo Park, so maybe I'll do this when it's time for, I'm not going to tell you what it is. It's, well, I'll tell you, it's, okay, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not going to. You will just see this, or maybe this, but most likely this. Okay, forget it. Last from Rooster of Menlo Park. Don't forget the tile murals they gave us, an unnecessary gift from an urban renewal clearance sale. Treating ancestors like bones thrown to dogs, a distraction like the friendship they offer, politicians like tax breaks they offer to cross the river, like tax liens on our homes they sell so easily. Cayense, escuchen. Ki kiri ki, ki kiri ki. Oh, old woman, still tends my heart. Behind a chain link fence at Melrose in Congress, she's bent since kisses, besitos. As she tosses grains and corn at my feet, I dance for her. See how I dance. I sing for her and the new neighbors. Welcome, welcome. Ki, kitty, ki, 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 ki. To the new neighbors to the construction crane skylines, to the smiling politicians, careful not to blink as they explain away every policy, every plan, every handshake, everything we always seem to misunderstand. We always misunderstand. From this house behind a chain link fence, I dance for you in your new office. I'd like to, I'd like to sit at your feet in City Hall and scratch out reminders that we are still here, waiting for you to remember, waiting for you to hear, waiting for you to stand, 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 dance, dance, dance. Ki, kitty, ki, ki, kitty, ki. To the Virgo Laga that burst through caliche and concrete to the ancestors every corner, even those con la pala en la frente. I dance, I dance, I sing, I sing. I'm here, still here.
So this is from a project that I call hello, uh, um, and I call Ebbles. Um, and it's really uh, this sort of exercise in close attention um, and watching how you watch things and how weird the that gets. Um, so, uh, so I've been basically right filling up these notebooks and then of these various situations and feelings and things and then taking stuff from that and doing weird shit with it. <laughs> so, um, this is my, what I wrote as a sort of um, elegy for my grandmother who passed this summer. Um, Desolate within, the staircase stops. Ovals on flowing shoulders, step back. Stars ancestry along wall tunnel fingers, hand hidden. Scarlet bounding this moss mole flip, flesh pinned, pressed hide to hide. It's grass, teeming over mountains. Miss Phil Crown remembers instants before barbed light. The letter sound clicks, clicks like a June bug against a screen with a soft rolling twang at the end. Dirty nails digging, hoping to perceive. Kafka, as for God, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Myself to the doorbell missionary. Satan was Jesus' boyfriend. <laughs> if the sky's blue were a men, I'd love you. Bush full of water, Texas ranger in bloom during summer. Lavender and coconut twirls along my curls. The breeze comes from behind this morning. Beside, labored rise and fall, a not quite blistering night with few stars, hand clutching covered in mouth, tenderness surrounding generic kachina pattern, mini dream beige and altered, the curtain nearly drawn, a kachina staff blossoms, awakening those beside. These flowers fold outward, cradling you in their blooms. Your ghost was in their breath. Subtle vapor. Sprinkle mind, exterior colossum, esophageal catch and hardwood rainbow, dreamt a terrazzo floor heaved as a sea, and brass Lazarus wove as Penelope at her loom. An elephant's foot hangs in the yard with a bird's nest a few feet below. Salon said reality must be one, seems joy must be one also. A fly lands on my thigh, rubs its forefeet together, and stomps around in circles. Tell me anything but a story. Thank you. So I will continue the participatory poetry stuff uh, by passing this around. And you don't need to read it. Um, this is, uh, I'm not going to read this to you. This is a poem. Uh, but the poem I'm going to read to you is about making this poem. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, you can try to pick a fragment out from it if you want. But you can also just like lay hands on it or commune with it or whatever you want to do. So um, you can pass it around. All right. This poem is called Marianne or Muriel. Some years ago, I met a billionaire who wore flip-flops and blue jeans, and he gave me $600 to make a poetry sculpture. I did not know what a poetry sculpture was, so I asked a friend for help. She suggested we begin by building a skeleton out of chicken wire and plywood. Then we dipped strips of fabric into quick-dry cement and laid them to rest on the armature, forming the largest organ. Sometimes, I would write a little sentence on one of the strips and thread it through the wire like a ligament. I think we gave it a name, like Marianne or Muriel, 
I can't remember. We felt like grimy little gods trying to pull a novel, squirming being through the needle eye of a dream. Occasionally, the billionaire would come to our workspace and stare blankly at our progress. I could tell he was disappointed almost from the beginning. He wore glasses, which was good, because I thought if there had been nothing between us and his eyes, we'd easily have been blistered with shame. With billions to spare, he still regretted the way we had failed to live up to the surplus of his dreams. But we labored on. In the final stages, I often felt like a surgeon grafting bits of skin from thigh to neck, belly to cleft. In the end, all we had to show for six weeks of labor was a massive catechism, 10 by 12, brute body with a crumbling exterior, something like a valorous, bloated mummy. You said it looked like a cluster of bacteria blown up and turned to stone. There was an exhibition. Eventually, my friend and I met at our studio one last time to put the poor creature out of its misery. This is the part I lose sleep about. We put on calming music and wore masks. Soon the air was filled with so much plaster dust you had to squint. It was surprisingly easy to collapse, to fold up and take out to the dumpster. This took only a few minutes. It no longer had a name, but it looked even more human. I stood on top of it and held out my arms. My friend took a photo. Finally, we felt the billionaire would be satisfied. I'm gonna read just one more, it's very short. Uh, yeah, it has nothing to do with this sculpture, but here it is. In the dream, I'm an executioner without a hood. I assemble a guillotine and line up every last one of my ancestors. The line is so long that I must squint to see where it ends. I usher them through one by one. Every time the slanted blade falls, it bounces off their necks, they sigh, stand up, and walk to the back of the line. I hone the blade, apologize for the delay, and mutter, next! That wasn't really a mutter. <laughs> next. My ancestors laugh as I lower their heads to the block. Would you like to trade places? Asks some ancient, unknown aunt with lotus feet. She helps me tie both hands behind my back and hoists the blade up to its cradle. Everyone applauds. <laughs> And that was Cameron Juan Louis. I didn't say his whole name before. Thank you, Cameron. Echoing others, this, there is great energy to the mm -hmm. I'm really sorry we're missing Tenny Nathanson. Yeah. Some of you know that's just kind of amazing. And he's one of the people, along with a couple other people in this room, who were here at the beginning of POG, which is now about 27 years old, which like for a poetry reading series in human terms, that's like living to 140. Yes. <laughs> uh, and yet it still feels like there's something fresh. Okay. I, I've been looking at old stuff because I'm old, and <laughs> because um, I, I've been asked to put together a kind of selected poems, so I've been looking back, and this is something from far back, um, particularly when I was thinking a lot about Gertrude Stein, and I was, you know, thinking about her, a rose is a rose, which is also eros, you know, the spirit of love, and, and eros, the little things that Cupid shoots, and all of that all together, so here you go. Arrows rose, a rose upon the ground. Upon ground, upon a pawn, the air rose. Prose, a rose upon ground, arrows repose. Ground, mound, rose, a rose, arrows. Suppose a rose, ground, arrows. Propose prose. The ground supposes air rose. Air poses a rose. Suppose the arrows. Rose impose upon the ground a rose. Air round a rose opposes. Arrows, arrows upon a ground around a rose. Poses, suppose the arrows, a rose, rose. 
around upon. Suppose, impose, propose a rose, a rose, rose upon, around, rose, grows, propose the arrows, rose, alas, arrows. I suppose there's something implicit in there too, uh, at least in Stein's, about a rose, like something arising, almost like arrows proposing a resurrection. It's, it's kind of cool. Uh, okay, and then, and, and also I wanted to say that, you know, invoking somebody like Stein, I mean, I love it that Marjorie Kemp was invoked here. Sun Ra was invoked here, <laughs> that, and, you know, and Shakespeare and others. And this next one is, is a little bit that. This is almost brand new, or at least for me, it's only a few weeks old. And it's a conversation between two great modernist writers, an, an imaginary conversation, two that may never have met, um, Virginia Woolf and H.D., Hilda Doolittle, uh, who, one was born in 1882, one in 1886, one is well known for surviving the bombings of London in World War I, the other for surviving the bombings of London in World War II, and all that enters here. So conversation in Virginia. Perhaps it is time to go in. The night is long and the lights do not stop flashing. The sounds do not stop crashing into our ears. As windows of buildings crash too into more pieces than there are strokes of color in that mountain painting by Cezanne. Do you remember when no one would talk of Cezanne, no London was not ready, as it's not ready now for another kind of destruction. Oh, but you are younger. You do not remember. Hilda, I don't know how you manage it, going around the city, giving aid in a time unaided for a people unknown. I remember 1915. Were you here? Did you close the curtains? Oh, everyone had curtains then. They were the rage, the very cutting thing. But the true cuts were those of the partisans, those who chose guns over silent views out the window of gardens and birds. Hilda, I don't think I shall survive this war. I'd rather go under for a time, perhaps for a time unending. And I don't think Leonard or anyone would prevent such a walk down. I don't think anyone much wants to be here anymore. Hilda, I've been hurt by men and their wars too. I once conjured Achilles and asked him why, but he had no answers. Though I don't think he cared so much for living either, or even for himself, just rather inept conceptions of honor. Later, I think I will write about him and about Helen, who questions him about such invalid valor. But how do you know what I remember anyway? Does one have to have been there to have seen, to have heard, to know? I think one looks through those broken planes of glass and sees the past. Not just that one they said would end all wars, but the one in Troy, the one in the northern part of China, the one when fools thought they could keep people in chains of iron and chains of the mind. Everything is a palimpsest. See through, see through. I hold all the memories, though it took me long to know them to see them. And Dr. Freud, that odd little man with somewhat pinched glasses, helped me to find the past, not even in the world at all, but in myself. A quiver like jellyfish, a quiver forever. Virginia, I have not meant to lessen what you have seen and given us. I have learned from your visions of women and men and, and upholstered rooms much of what I hold dear. And I want to free you to go where you must, to carry the stones as you will, Virginia. Or maybe I do know why you give aid. I mean, what else is writing? Yet its succor may only help some future walkers on this same green, the green I see as I walk each day, whereas to aid those hurt, whether by bullets or bombs or simply egos that won't allow peace to flourish, that kind of aid is now, and now is indeed where I live. I walked tonight along the Serpentine River and thought such thoughts of now, of the water, of the light in motion, of our unending 
and terribly odd mix of suffering and laughter. Hilda, you and your bodies of water, Virginia, and I too go deep under such wetness, or perhaps it is a part of me. But tonight I'm taking water to those who have returned from the war, who may have to return there as well. And I think I may write of the walls I passed, the walls blown partially away. They reveal older walls, for walls only fall if we erase their memories. The walls and the shards of glass are our own brokenness, our fragments Tom wrote about, though he seemed to make of ancient archaeology a kind of martyr, such as he would personally have to recover, have to protect against further ruin. I don't think that's right. I think we need old wisdom, yes, and old images, but it's not a matter of preservation. No, more like that serpentine river of which you speak. Where does it go? Where will we go? Virginia. Oh, jangle, jangle, my friend, my new friend. Don't stay in the cloud. There really are bombs falling around you. There really are rails pulled out and their metal used to manufacture new guns. There really are bombings in London and Norfolk and Dublin, though some of those are for freedom, which I know something about, at least as far as women and young men with dreams are concerned. Jangle things about, my friend, my young dreamer. Hilda, thank you, Virginia, thank you. The one who transversed the world as a more or less impervious, sex-changing, amorphous marvel, unafraid. I need to lose my cloudy self sometimes. Walk the ways of a new world, crumbling though it may be. Lisa Ferial Martin. There's a handful of these chapbooks at the front table, and it's a collaboration of a bunch of POG board members and friends. Really great collection um, that got published by Chax in 2021. And it had a um, hand-painted black and white uh, pomegranate that Cynthia Miller added to the front of each one and just recently she added color to some and I got really excited to see them again. So they're ten dollars, they're over on the table and they're kind of a treasure. Here's one poem from the Lookout Tower for Russell Baker. I'm sleeping with E.E. E. Cummings. The complete poems, black cover from 72 jammed against my thigh. Not refined, more buck than bite. I read him 13 times a night. Aeneas gets it, I can feel it. She moves shimmering with heat in June. Now you're over me, wrapped in night. Drove the rim road by moonlight. Brazened, blazing through atmosphere, Pocked tectites, peridot, olivine, scattered at the canyon edge. And one more for fun. So this was inspired, this poem, by a post on Reddit by a vampire apologist. <laughs> I have 15 years worth of outstanding library finds in three separate cities. And it's my hope that eventually a bounty hunter librarian will come to collect and will get in a bar fight and fall in love. So this Alex Hunter Reeves responds, as a person, I think this is funny, but as a librarian, this really annoys me. <laughs> I'm a librarian, it didn't annoy me. <laughs> and 
vampire apologist responds, I'm newly terrified by the implication that librarians aren't people. <laughs> and I've misjudged what exactly I'm up against. So that was my inspiration for the following poem that um, I think needs a stronger ending, but I haven't gotten around to it yet. The Bounty Hunter Librarian after Vampire Apologist. <laughs> The bounty hunter librarian is coming for me, and I don't care. I'm only curious and, frankly, ready for an adventure. Will they drag me in cuffs back to my hometown in Jersey? Did I leave there with an illustrated copy of The Hobbit or Ginsburg's Howl? Did I disappear with Aeneas Nin's Delta of Venus? Maybe when I was living out of a truck, picking fruit in the orchards of eastern Washington, and the address for my Wenatchee library card was general delivery, I walked off with the color purple, or fear and loathing in Las Vegas. <laughs> Will they find me at Trader Joe's, or the Shanty, or Sabino Canyon? Will they track me down at my local library or the Unitarian Church? <laughs> Will I be reading this poem at an open mic when I'm taken into custody? <laughs> Will a group of poets overwhelm the bounty hunter librarian and give me a chance to escape? <laughs> but instead, we all go out for beers and decide to meet up again soon at the poetry festival or the mariachi conference because the bounty hunter librarian is kind of hot. <laughs> And we all want to be her friend, don't you? <laughs> Cynthia Miller, Cynthia Miller, you are up. is a Buddhist book on history of Buddhism. I still have it. It's written by a woman, um, which is very unfortunate. <laughs> I'm just saying it. Oh. Oh, such a thief. So honesty has been on my mind a lot. It's kind of on my burner this week, so I wrote this little poem. Honesty is the hand that comes from the sleeve of doubt. Honesty cuts and mends softens and stops. When the woman lies to me, her arms shrink at her sides, her eyes get really small, even her hair looks suspicious. I say that all I want is honesty, this or these or those or none. Oh, here comes an ear ring. Yeah, it's been very busy. It's, it's all right, really fine. Leave me as I am. And then I have this confession poem. This is to Publishers Clearinghouse. <laughs> I just, you know, it's Yom Kippur, right? So you're supposed to, like, tonight is the night you hold all people dear to you that you've lost. And tomorrow you make amends for all the bullshit you brought onto other people's lives. <laughs> anyway, so here's a Publishers Clearinghouse. <laughs> I didn't buy a ticket for this contest, but I did buy solar lights three different times, cat toys, kitchen towels, brick stickers, a travel bag, scissors, a round rug, night goggles, a bendy kitchen sink, plastic sleeves, tomato clips, blue iris, and cashews, powerful flashlights, a rollout pad of flower seeds, push pin with wall strip with push pins. The best was a teeny tiny metal mail truck with its teeny tiny blue mailbox for my teeny tiny life. I know it so well and it never changes. Like living in the country song. Not sure if I'm winning anything anymore. Nobody at my door. Abundance a river running somewhere by. 
probably why I bought Blooming Red Flowers, music by Meatloaf, music by Sam Cooke, muffin papers I used to use, a giant pancake flipper, so many rubber things, cloth things, cheap things, wrong texture, too small, too wrong, too nobody really needs this shit. What am I doing? Tear that sticker, find a stamp. Did I, did I, did I, did I, me? <laughs> And last, but certainly not least, Logan Phillips. Hi, friends. Um, yes, thank you for having me, and uh, it's been a really fun night. I'm going to read one piece um, from this project, which is the latest number in a serial ongoing project called Novografias. And um, it just came out this week. And when I read this poem, the train happened during the poem. So I'm a few minutes too late. All right. Don't want to write five senses, five centuries. I'd rather an instrument of stones. A quaint ghost bosque gather smallest life and journey toward impossible arrival. Stare until something else emerges, not ruins, but shadow, shape, and depth. I shade myself there, where I make the mistake of spelling and meaning comes to dust devil. All that I have to work with past what I've been given. So much that I stare. Select sky, adjustment layer, delete. Signs surround and overexpose my walking reality guided by a stripe on the sidewalk. An invention of ours. City as seen from bike. You could say that I'm something of a built environment myself, where dust to dust is a best case scenario. Realm of symbol, where everything built a facade, words and obscure. In the garden, every rock an arrangement. Type set in the power lines, through lines, strung above my head and along the streets I walk. For all the unbroken, broken two cycles of conquest, look, if I could say it, I would. A garden takes forever, and then suddenly forever happens. Garden, a time-telling device. I spent all summer establishing plants and then watching them die, standing still enough that a dove makes a nest on my head. The image is not a crown, but finally a toupee of twigs, the highest honor to go out as fertilizer. So bury me in a basin, add another layer of wood chips, call it a day, call it a little lifetime, happily apocalypse. I'll be another holy wondering who my body carbon sunk, but first prove that you are not a robot. Click on all the squares with mesquite branches. <laughs> Click on all the squares with a sense of place. Click on all the squares that typify your relationship to plants, then open portal access process.pdf. I am who I conspire with. Open space, something left to tell the story, to walk the physical plane and understand in situ. It's another way of saying, get there before the bulldozers do. The poem, all arrivalful, also nowhere, a continuity. Everyone thinks they are the exception. Me, I'm just selling my living hours and creative energies in return for food and shelter. So how about it? Well, at first light, the sigils come through sun glare. If I stare at sun letters, long happens parallel, one dawn at a time. Thank you.
just want to thank you all for being here.